so thank you all for being here this afternoon. And uh, we have a very interesting book to discuss, uh, which, uh, which I think uh, you have had, uh, uh, Sriram has had a few discussions around this book, uh, in, uh, in, I think mostly in Delhi. Uh, so uh, we look, uh, and uh, it's, it's a topic which, in a, in, I think in our own ways, we have been grappling with for quite some time. Uh, in the policy space, in the academic space, uh, as well as um, in terms of our day-to-day -day conversations. Uh, so what does the arrival of Mr. Trump mean for the international order? And so it's very brave of uh, Sri Ram to have written this book um, even before the Trump period is over. But I think the, uh, the, some of the issues that he highlights uh, perhaps are very germane to a lot of the policy conversations and a lot of the academic conversations that we are having and we continue to have about the rise of other powers. Uh, and what does it mean uh, to be living in an era which is being defined by the relative decline of the US and the rise of China? Uh, he tackles it uh, very interestingly with the help of uh, four cases that he studies in this book, uh, which highlight in their own ways how other powers are equally, uh, have their own agency and are shaping this international order uh, between these two behemoths uh, around. Uh, so with that, let me invite Sriram first to make a few comments, and then we have uh, two uh, distinguished set of commentators, uh, Manpreet Sethi from CAPS and uh, Manon Joshi from uh, our very own, uh, from ORF. Um, so Sriram, why don't you take the floor and, and give us a brief insight into the book. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Always an honor to be at the top uh, think tank of the country uh, on uh, strategic affairs. Uh, my last uh, appearance here as a speaker was in 2016 uh, when Modi doctrine was released and we had a really good uh, discussion at the time. Um, since then, uh, as you can see, uh, some people say I've moved towards uh, um, big people-centered books now. Uh, this is the second big person around whom a book I've structured, uh, although uh, the caveat always has been that these are not biographies. Uh, neither Modi doctrine nor Trump are biographies of uh, our leader or of the US president. Um, but they are based on uh, an understanding that these individuals represent a wider phenomenon and that they um, are symptoms of something bigger. So that was the... Um, that was the starting point for this work. And um, just yesterday I was reading, you, some of you may have seen the news, um, after Boris Johnson, another Trump alike, um, just uh, swept the elections in the UK, um, Steve Bannon, who is uh, the ideological um, guru of Trump, and although he's no longer in the White House as the um, uh, chief advisor, he continues to be the influential force be behind Trump's uh, right-wing populist movement. Uh, Steve Bannon commented on Boris Johnson's victory and said, populism is the future, economic nationalism is the future. Um, now, of course, um, Bannon uh, may be optimistic and maybe there are going to be lots of roadblocks to this phenomenon uh, and uh, possibly some defeats ahead for it too. Uh, but um, for the moment, it captures the zeitgeist of the, um, especially of the Western world, but also like in one of the chapters of this book, I have um, Jair Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, uh, and what he represents, uh, it's also covered. But the point I'm saying is that um, this uh, right-wing populism um, is actually a force to reckon with, and it uh, by its very nature, is quite antithetical to existing norms of or ideas of what the West should be and how it should conduct itself in the world. Um, and it's a force from within that uh, has in many ways undermined or weakened the West as a whole, but especially the US, but also a lot of European countries, uh, their uh, will it has undermined their will to impose themselves around the world, to show leadership, to exert uh, influence, and to dominate other parts of the world. Um, and it's 
there are a number of strands to this. I show them in the book. There's isolationism, there's a transactionalism, there is a, you know, the withdrawal mentality, and also um, a single-minded obsession for trade and to try and extract more trade concessions from, from other countries, an unwillingness to commit resources to partners and allies, and a narrow vision based on the idea that each country must look out for its own um, very narrow self-interest, um, which do not necessarily encompass any generosity or altruism or broader enlightened self-interest. There's no enlightened self-interest. There's just narrow self-interest. That is Trump. And that is this populism we're talking about. And all of you have been following it. Uh, I uh, studied this at great length, both the populism as a phenomenon, but also historically and contemporary uh, populism. And uh, much of the introduction of the book is about that. Uh, but then I take off from that point, this is not necessarily a book about the US per se. It's about what happens when um, a globalization force, a, glo a globalist or a liberal internationalist force like the US um, suddenly is confronted with this kind of leader political leadership at home, which is uh, trying to overturn at least seven decades of orthodoxy on its head. And if this, if this is, a, is going to be a trend, or as Bannon is saying, this is the future, then what does it mean for the world order? And especially for those who are capable powers uh, in different regions of the world and who will directly be impacted by this isolationism, transactionalism, withdrawal, or, or miserliness, and add up all these together into a single thing. That's, uh, that's Trump. Um, so I began to look at what does it mean for different regions of the world. There hasn't been a study like this on Middle East, um, uh, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, and the impact of uh, the Trump phenomenon or the populism in, in more general terms. And uh, because it's assumed that you know, structures are forever, uh, or at least they change very rarely. And most people think that the big structural transformation in world politics only happened 1991, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And that essentially, it is still either, there are some, you know the, you know the debate, there are some who say that it's still a unipolar world. Uh, and many, like Yang Zuetong, the famous Chinese uh, scholar uh, at, at Tsinghua who says that we are already in a bipolar world. Um, but And then many of us in the rest of the emerging power centers, we believe it's a multipolar world uh, uh, or it's on its way to becoming genuinely multipolar, right? So, um, how does um, this president, who suddenly emerges out of nowhere like a bolt from the blue, very unexpected victory, and who looks likely to win again uh, next November, um, what does this do to these configurations? Unipolar, I think, my, so to, 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 to put it crudely, the unipolar era was anyway over um, in terms of because China is approximately 60 to 70% of the comprehensive national power of the United States. Uh, and that is roughly the same difference between the top two powers as was the case in 1947 between the US and the Soviet Union. So if we can accept those that as a bipolar era, then uh, the argument is, why is this not a bipolar? Uh, and then the number three, number four, number five in comprehensive national power are way behind, uh, relatively speaking. So it looks like um, uh, Trump uh, is fast forwarding this shift away from unipolar to bipolar. And my argument is even more so, given time, populism will ensure that we, it becomes a multipolar world order. So extrapolating from the domestic politics to the global uh, order. This is, this, been, this is the work, I mean, in a very theoretical sense. Now coming to the chapters, what I'm trying to do is in each region, I'm looking for major um, unresolved crises, hotspots, uh, and problems. And I'm asking, what was the role of the United States in each of these continents or, or regions? Um, until Obama, how has Trump changed it? And what is that doing? Is it creating 
new opportunities and spaces for regional powers to fill the vacuum and to assert themselves. So this is in, in a summary of the book, most of the book. And in Asia, I'm looking at uh, essentially two big puzzles, but also a broader, wider uh, cast of issues. But here I'm looking at Afghanistan as one and then the Indo-Pacific. These two as the litmus cases, um, what the United States used to do in these countries, what Trump is doing or not doing anymore, or pulling out, and what does that mean, leave um, a country like India, which had banked upon some kind of a, um, uh, a presence of the NATO and US forces and American uh, uh, coalition building in this region for a long time. And uh, what happens to the uh, balance of power in this region? What happens to the security in this region? What happens to um, stability of uh, hotly contested areas like Afghanistan, for example, in this region? What happens to the BRI um, and many other uh, phenomena like those? So my argument is that essentially that the US is incapable of, uh, of, of pushing back further gains that China is going to make in this region. And even if it is capable, it lacks the will under this populist um, phenomenon. Because you know, the, the, um, the, the construct of the populace is that all this you know, uh, power positioning and uh, great power politics and uh, um, supporting of allies and um, having troops and bases and you know, giving them trade concessions and making them, propping them up to <laughs> prevent any region of the world from uh, rival hegemons rising. That game does not benefit American workers. The argument is that it may benefit some US companies, it may benefit American elites, it be benefits the liberal internationalists as Trump, or, or globalism, <laughs> the false ideology of globalism uh, as which Trump rejects. And the argument is that America being a kind of a global super cop has never benefited the American working class. It's a very radical view, very close to the far left view. Uh, so as you know, far right populism has a lot in common with the far left. And that's why they're so popular because they're able to appropriate a lot of the um, working class votes as we just saw with Boris Johnson in the UK um, or Trump in 2016. Um, so um, counterbalancing China does not seem to be a kind of like a, you know, a byword of American foreign policy anymore, at least not that of the Trump faction within the complex American system. So this book talks about the duel that's going on within different factions inside the US government and the broader American polity. It's not one yet. Um, I mean, Trump has been frustrated at many points he wants to pull out of many other places around the world. He doesn't believe in this whole imperial, liberal imperial agenda. Uh, in fact, in that sense, he's refreshingly different because he doesn't judge countries. He doesn't uh, have the same kind of a moral, you know, uh, superiority complex that most American leaders in the past had. And um, he just thinks all these people are ungrateful and they don't deserve my aid or my soldiers or my um, uh, support, you know. Uh, it's a very mercenary notion of U.S. force presence and uh, force uh, power projection around the world. Let's come back home or Japan. You pay up a few more billion dollars and I'll keep my troops there. Otherwise, why am Japan is a rich country. It should be able to defend itself, right? That's the populist logic. Um, just to give one example, um, India should be doing much more to save Afghanistan. Why am I, you know, spending uh, trillions? 7,000 miles away. I got some schools to build in Alabama, not Afghanistan. Let Modi do the lifting there. Mm -hmm. So then moving on to the Middle East, um, that's another interest. I, I had, so there are a number of emerging powers. You know, I could have used um, regional powers like Iran. Israel is also a regional power. Saudi is a regional power, but so is Turkey. But I took Turkey because I wanted to at least have one uh, treaty US ally as a case to show how treaty allies of the US are responding to the Trump phenomenon. So while India is only a strategic partner, not a treaty ally, uh, Turkey is. And so in, the, in chapter two, I'm looking at Erdogan and um, this you know, very, very troubled 
you know, relationship uh, he has with the US and how he is an ally, but is in many ways undermining NATO from inside and in is laying bare the severe contradictions within NATO. And um, um, I look at Turkey and the region, the broader Middle East region, and how Trump's withdrawal from Syria, for example, the most recent one, but more generally, um, you know, his apathy for um, uh, maintaining the traditional US role there of being a guarantor of allies and these kind of things, the most famous being the tussle between Qatar and Saudi and how Trump blatantly took the side of one of the allies to the detriment of the other, of the other ally. Um, these kind of things come through, but most importantly, the question is, what is Turkey capable of doing and does it have the will? So there are always these two questions we IR professors ask, does the country have the capability or, and the will you know, to offer leadership? Can it fix the, the crisis in Syria? Uh, um, or uh, in Iraq, or in Lebanon, or in the broader region, um, if the United States is less and less interested, or is distracted, or is uh, moving away um, from, you know, uh, from injecting itself into all the major issues here in the region. Um, in some, uh, in, you will find that there is a nuance to my argument. I'm not saying that Trump is pulling out completely from any of these regions. Um, in fact, you will know that there is an obsession they have with uh, with with uh, Iran and the potential threat it poses. Trump has reimposed sanctions on Iran, maximum pressure uh, strategy and all that. But the question really for me is, what does it do to Turkey? Is it making Turkey life easier for Erdogan and for Turkey or harder? And the evidence is out there. And what I'm saying is that Turkey could, could capitalize on the um, Trump phenomenon. Uh, as it has in a way, because the moment the US uh, withdrew from northern Syria, the Turkish invaded instantly, within 24 hours. It was like a coordinated action. And I show all those you know, dramatic phone calls between Erdogan and Turkey and how they have um, um, colluded in some ways. Um, in, in, so, so, so Trump wants to have none of Syria and get out, and Erdogan is right next door, and he says, you take care of it, and Erdogan actually makes matters worse by invading. Um, and now, you know, they're committing war crimes, the Turkish military. And uh, thankfully, we made a bold pronouncement a few, few weeks ago condemning Turkish incursion into Syria. Um, but the point is, Turkey, uh, my assessment is, does not have the will or the vision, especially under President Erdogan, to be able to really provide the leadership uh, to stabilize the region uh, in the absence of the US. Um, and. Um, Moving on to, to, to Latin America, this is a case you know, very dear to my heart because you know, the Western Hemisphere is not well understood here and our knowledge um, you know, about Latin America is rather low and although we have some specialists in think tanks, esteemed institutions like this one, overall for a country of our size, we don't just have enough of a focus on that region. You know? And even if there is, it's, a, it's strictly bilateral. It's about what India and 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 you know in, individual countries in Latin America are doing, uh, and and that's necessary. But I think the it was also important to give a kind of a global context as to what's happening there in light of the Trump revolution. And there um, you will find again some contradictions. Trump huffed and puffed a little bit about uh, Maduro and removing the regime in Venezuela by force. Um, uh, but largely has been disinterested. I mean, his, his, his primary uh, uh, um, lens through which he looks at Latin America is immigrants. These Hispanics, they're coming over, they're invading our country. I'm positioning troops on the border, uh, on the southern border. By the way, he put more troops on the southern border than in Afghanistan or in Syria. Um, so that tells you the mindset of the populists. You know. What is the national security threat to Donald Trump it is these hordes coming from Honduras or uh, Nicaragua or El Salvador via Mexico or Guatemala. It's not uh, a Taliban takeover in Afghanistan or uh, Al Qaeda takeover um, uh, in the deserts of Mali. Right? So it's a very homeland centric vision of what is national security and what is US interests. And you would have noticed that if you're following the text of the uh, Taliban peace talks that's happening, sorry, I'm digressing back to our region, 
Um, the the Zalme Khalilzad is simply trying to extract um, guarantees that there will be no attack on the U.S. homeland or on American facilities or, uh, or, or installations by any group based in Afghanistan. That's all. Um, whether they take over the country, whether they destroy the region, whether it becomes a, like a jihadist paradise, doesn't matter. Right? It's a very narrow, homeland-centric vision. So um, coming back to, 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 to Latin America, Brazil, I, I had to take up Brazil simply because despite its you know, recent economic uh, crisis for the last several years and the political upheavals, um, it remains demographically and economically the largest in the region. And um, Argentina does not come close. You know, there was a time when there was a lot of rivalry, but Brazil has left it behind um, uh, in terms of size and, and influence. But the question really now is, is it losing it uh, under the current leadership of Jair Bolsonaro? Now, Bolsonaro, uh, I find there's a very, very strange you know, kind of uh, intersection with Trump. They are very similar to each other. They admire each other. Ideologically, there's a lot in common. And uh, the Bolsonaro phenomenon, uh, again, it's early to judge. It's only about a year or less than a year since he took office in January this year. But my um, reading uh, from, from talking to diplomats and to Latin America experts is he has got a very contrary vision, like Trump, uh, for Brazil. And this includes redefining the identity of Brazil as a white country or as a white European country. Uh, and denying the fact that black people or people of African origin are actually 60% or more of Brazil's population. And taking it back to the Eurocentric vision. So you can call it racist or whatever, but essentially it's like that. You know, That's why he looks up to Trump and looks up to Europe much more than to the old model of Brazil, which was based on leadership of the global south. Now, how, 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 how pragmatic this policy is, time will tell. But my argument in chapter um, three of the book is that Brazil um, will be better off going back to its role as a leader of the region rather than as a junior partner of Trump's America. So the space that is being created in the region by Trump's disinterest or apathy, sheer apathy, that's what it is. Um, could have been filled by Brazil, but Brazil is actually looking uh, up to the US um, in a very servile manner right now to try and get bring them in and then solve the crisis in Venezuela next door. And that's why um, you may have read the news, very shocking from a Latin American point of view, Bolsonaro visited the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, uh, along with his son. And his son, Eduardo Bolsonaro, the senator, even tweeted about uh, saying, we are so proud to be working with this great institution called the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, if you know the history of Latin America and the destabilization uh, that happened uh, through covert interventions of the CIA, this is the reversal I'm talking about. The populists completely have inverted the um, traditional norms of what is good and bad, what is moral, morally right and wrong. And so, um, so, be it Venezuela, be it the trade uh, scenario in the region, be it the OAS, the Organization of American States, most of the institutions, economic, security, um, multilateral institutions of that region, uh, Bolsonaro is increasingly uh, willing to suborn Brazil to the US. And um, that's not going to solve Brazil's basic problem, which is the encroachment by China in Latin America. Um, so Brazil, I mean, the US is not even pretending to challenge China in Latin America. I mean, Hillary Clinton briefly wanted that when she was Secretary of State. Under Trump, it's nothing. It's just do deals with all these countries, pay off Mexico, pay off a few countries, keep these immigrants out. You know? That's it. Nothing else. So, um, and the reason why he made the noise about Venezuela are well covered in the book. There is a, when, if Trump seems activist in foreign policy, occasionally, on particular countries, like Venezuela or Iran, you need to understand the domestic political calculation behind it. And I've done that. I've explained in how the uh, Venezuelan Americans, the Cuban Americans in Florida and their votes matter for him. And that's why he, he did that rhetorical thing. But following that, nothing. So people like um, John Bolton, the hardline national security advisor, a former NSA, wanted military intervention 
through Colombia and through uh, Brazil to overthrow the regime in Venezuela. Nothing came of it. When it comes to troops or when it comes to anything that costs money, Trump said, why should we be wasting our, our resources? Just stay off it. Um, is a restraining hand on all these hawks um, who want much more action. You may have seen a very famous um, uh, photograph of, jo of John Bolton when he was NSA, a yellow uh, scribbling pad in English saying, 5,000 troops to Colombia. And inadvertently or deliberately let out to the media. Almost like a kind of um, mm, psychological warfare to, to scare a, a, a Maduro. Uh, and, and he was coordinating with Bolsonaro. And now nothing came of it. So Brazil is left with the same problem. The crisis next door, the refugees, complete instability and chaos uh, in, in Venezuela. And it's not able to do anything because it's not taking its own initiative. It's relying on the US or hoping that the US will you know, pull the Brazilian chestnuts out of the fire. And I think that's the wrong way to go. Brazil still has other factions opposing Bolsonaro. And I've explained those. I've gone very deep into the Brazilian politics of today, the different factions in the government, and how they are uh, uh, trying to resist the Bolsonaro approach to foreign policy. And uh, I am relatively hopeful that Brazil will come out of this in the sense that the vice president and the, even the Brazilian military is very reluctant to go along with the US dependent model. And um, in terms of trade, uh, they've become over dependent on China for their exports, a little bit like the Australia in our region. Uh, and they need to wean themselves away from it. And Trump is not giving any concessions. You must have seen after the book got written uh, two, two, two uh, weeks ago, Trump imposed fresh sanctions on Brazilian agriculture products. Uh, sorry, not sanctions, uh, tariffs, tariffs. Um, uh, so I think uh, yoking your fortunes to the US and working along with them is not going to work for any of the emerging powers. That's the basic message I'm saying. The US will matter to some of these countries. The US will matter. US still has you know, forces and um, deep connections that uh, Trump cannot undo in three years or eight years. Um, so, but nonetheless, that cannot be the sole you know, factor on which you can uh, rely upon to solve your strategic dilemmas for any of these countries. Now, coming to Africa, I'm running out of time. You know, again, it was a toss-up between Nigeria and, and South Africa. But I took Nigeria because one, again, demographically, it's 200 million people. South Africa is much smaller. And two, Nigeria is the only genuine black power on, on Earth. I mean, South Africa, you know, is divided and the economic levers are still in the hands of white elites. It's not really a truly African country yet in terms of the power inequalities and the what is called the economic apartheid. So Nigeria um, has problems around its neighborhood, including in its own uh, parts of its own country in the north with the Boko Haram insurgency. But the bigger issue is with the spreading ISIS and Al Qaeda um, wave in the Sahel region. And there also I described what the US was doing in Nigeria before until Obama, and how Trump, highly impatient and disinterested and racist and all those things, doesn't care and has been pulling out troops. Um, there's been a huge US downsizing of special forces and others after an incident that happened in Niger, right next door. And um, in the last two to three years, the US has cut all development assistance, uh, security assistance um, to UN peacekeeping forces, to individual countries. Um, they've narrowed down, you know, they stay, say that they're still doing some counterterrorism cooperation here and there with a few countries in, 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 in Africa, including Nigeria, but it's peanuts. Uh, what Trump is interested in is in sales, right? So Buhari, President Mohammed Buhari, managed to buy some attack helicopters and a few things from the US, which had, under Obama's time, been, um, um, been um, withheld on human rights grounds, saying that the Nigerian military is committing human rights abuses. So because Trump is not judgmental, because he's not liberal, he doesn't distinguish between democracy and authoritarian countries and all that, um, he's, he's, he's happy to, you know, where whoever buys is a is good country. Whoever buys American products is a good country, right? Um, and that's how he, that's his yardstick to, to divide countries between good and bad. 
So in that sense, Nigeria has benefited to some extent, but I also show in the book that Nigeria reliance on the US to keep the French factor under check. That was historically Nigeria's expectation. The, the US presence in the region will help to keep the la francophonie at bay because France has been stymieing Nigeria's rise for the last 30, 40 years at least. You know, and now the French have got a huge presence in Mali and uh, in, in Chad, in Niger, and they, they run their own currency for the sub-block of ECOWAS countries, which are francophony. There are more than 10 such small countries that are under kind of neo-colonial French uh, domination there. And Nigeria has been consistently frustrated by France. They used to rely on the US to somewhat keep uh, France off balance or keep it under check. No longer. Trump is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. Get me out of here. Let the French you know, take over or whoever. Um, so it's in that kind of context that Nigeria has a big opportunity to take the lead. It will need to do more, but there is a lot of skepticism because of its un inability to overcome the Boko Haram uh, insurgency at home. Uh, so if, they, if you can't beat Boko Haram at home, how can you beat ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the entire Sahel region or in the Sahara as a whole? That's the challenge. But I've shown how Nigeria can connect with other countries in the, in the region, how Nigeria was very reluctant to join the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, ACFTA, and how it joined, signed up at the very last moment and how Nigeria being the largest market, the number one economy of Africa, needs to do more to win the confidence of its neighbors. Let me just conclude with one point about uh, one larger uh, theoretical point I've made in the book. This is the theory of bandwagoning. You know, some of you in the IR, those who are in the IR community know it. All these regions, the Western liberals have put up this theory that if the US withdraws, if Trump uh, fulfills all his uh, wishes, and he's allowed to fulfill all his wishes and pulls out, from all these places, the Chinese will take over. This has been the, the theory of bandwagoning. Small countries you know, ha need the protection of uh, one superpower or the other. If one is withdrawing, then the other will take over. Um, and so the Chinese are going to now spread their talents, influence all over the place. We are conceding the world to China on a platter. That is the criticism of Western liberals. And I have challenged this in the book. I am saying that you look at the emerging powers, we are not interested in Chinese hegemony. If the US withdrawing, we'll find other means to counterbalance China, including the US, but not primarily the US. You see, the, the, the earlier assumption was NATO or the US is going to be there, and they will somehow push back the Chinese. And you know, the theory of swing states, I've challenged that in my earlier book of Modi doctrine also. That assumes that you know these countries, emerging powers, uh, can tilt the balance in favor of one of the great powers or the other by joining hands with one or the other. But here I'm saying, and in the last book too, that if you think of yourself as a swing state, that's a sign of dependence. And that's why in our country we come up with the idea of leading power. And that's something that I'm quite hopeful about India's role, uh, to be able to fill the vacuum being left by the US. But we, we will still need you know, a lot more strategizing for that to happen. Some ideas I've thrown out. So to, to sum it up, the idea that the Chinese will somehow take over the world and that they are cheering for Trump to get reelected. Um, so barring the trade dispute, you know, which they are now going to settle anyway, um, it doesn't look like the multilateral coalition building is happening at all to keep China under check in any of these regions, right? Because Trump has no interest in such things. Coalition, it takes money, takes resources, takes diplomatic, uh, you know, Commitment, all that. Trump is unwilling to do any of those things, to, to oil these coalitions, keep them together, and to prevent the rise of you know, uh, an alternative hegemony. So, uh, but will Nigeria, Brazil, Turkey, or India, or any of the other emerging powers I have not covered in the book, let's say Indonesia, um, let's say Iran, um, let's say South Africa, will any of us be, be simply, um, you know, um, flatly be willing to allow us to be rolled over by the Chinese in our respective regions? No. I think we will protect our spheres of influence, even though we don't call it that. right? We want to expand our spheres of influence. We want to become great powers and equals of China one day. And that is the goal. right? And for that to happen, there are stratagems, there are tactics, all kinds of things. Some I've discussed, but some I'm leaving open to, to, to thinkers and researchers to carry the work forward. Because without that thinking, the assumption that America will somehow keep the Chinese dragon under check, I think that's outdated. 
let's wake up from you know the liberal internationalist assumptions we are in a new era as steve bannon calls it it might very well be the future thank you Uh, thank you, Sriram. And as you would have heard, this is a very ambitious book. And in some ways, uh, what is interesting also about the book is that it is very lucidly written, uh, despite a lot of the academic uh, and international relations theoretical concepts that are used here. Uh, their application is more empirical, and I think, uh, therefore, it's, it's a quite enjoyable read. I would uh, ask Manpreet, uh, who's a C Man Dr. Sethi, who is a senior fellow with Center for Air Power Studies, to now give her comments on the book. Thank you, Dr. Pant, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and also thanks to Gayatri for rushing the book to me and uh, making the logistics available uh, for having me here. Uh, Dr. Cholia, I've thoroughly enjoyed reading the book. I think it's, uh, as everyone said, an ambitious uh, you know, effort. The scope and the sweep of the effort running across so many continents and the number of issues that you've raised with each country, I think it's really commendable. I would. Uh, like to recommend the reading of the book by everyone. It's a very reader-friendly book. So even if uh, you took two years to write, I had less than two weeks to read it, but I still could manage to do uh, some bit of justice. And in any case, I think um, uh, President Trump makes for a very interesting subject, uh, both to the writer and the reader. So uh, it's an easy book to read. Uh, while it's dealing with some very deep and weighty issues, it doesn't weigh you. Uh, in and therefore, you know, you you enjoy reading it. Now, uh, the the book is very catchily titled "Trumped" because that's exactly what Donald Trump has been doing to the world. He's trumped us all on many of the issues. But the bo as uh, Dr. Cholia said, the book is not really about him or even his actions. It's about the effect of his actions uh, as is playing out across the world. Um, and I quite agree with the logic. Uh, of the choice that you've made of the four emerging countries. Um, uh, but I also want to mention that the re-emergence of Russia, the continued presence of European Union, Japan, and South Korea as power centers of their own kind uh, cannot be ignored. So while you are recommending that the emerging powers come together uh, to form some kind of a way of you know, looking after their own interests, uh, these are some of the other power centers. They're not emerging nations, but they're power centers nevertheless, uh, which will determine whether these emerging countries are able to emerge uh, or not, um, uh, besides the actions of the US. Now, many of us who are interested in this subject, I think, would also have read Farid Zakaria's book, uh, The Post-American World, which he wrote in 2008. And his primary argument then was that the rise of the rest of the world has led to a fall in the relative pre preeminence of the US. Uh, so while he was clear that there was a relative decline in the US predominance, uh, he nevertheless believed that the US would remain the power center and that uh, uh, the, the rivalries and the differences between the rest of the world will allow uh, the US uh, to continue to be what he called an honest broker uh, because they would still be the ones who would be defining the agenda, laying out uh, you know, all kinds of uh, issues and mobilizing coalitions. Uh, a decade down the line from then, from 2008 to now, uh, when you've written this book, we've reached a stage where the US is the preeminent power for sure. Uh, by any measure of economic or military might, they are far ahead of anybody else. They have the ability, as you said, to set the agenda. Uh, and everything else that Zakaria th thought that the US would be able to do. But it's, an, it's a nation today that doesn't want to do any of these things. That's precisely, I think, the argument that you're making, that uh, it's a forfeiture of that status by the US, um, where it doesn't want to be the global policeman any longer. And it's a deliberate and a conscious act that they're retracting from various parts of the world. Um, so no expansive engagement uh, with the rest of the world is what Trump is you know, putting his uh, money on. So now it's your contention that this retreat uh, of the US from the regions that it earlier was so actively engaged in is creating space for the emerging powers to occupy. That since the US is coming back, uh, it's in the interest of these emerging powers to be able to occupy the space which was earlier uh, completely uh, controlled uh, by the US, and you are making this argument by studying these four case studies. Now, uh, 
my question then when I was looking at this hypothesis was that will the emerging powers be able to make use of this opportunity to finally emerge? And I'm glad that you said that the will and the vision, uh, that's exactly what I felt that how many of them do have a conscious vision that they want to occupy this space or that they're able to do it because of their capability. Uh, you've done a case-by-case -case study of the various countries and looked at the issues which will allow them or not allow them uh, to have this kind of a vision and the capability. So since I can't add uh, very much more meaningfully uh, to what is already there in the book, I just thought I would telescope a bit outside um, and try and look at what would be the essentials or the necessary conditions for these four emerging powers, uh, which are discussed in the book, uh, to be able to succeed in this endeavor. Now, in bits and pieces, it's all there in the book. But what I'm trying to do is to look at five major issues that I think would be the determining factors as to whether these emerging powers will be able to live up to the expectation that Dr. Cholia has from, uh, of them. So the first one I, I identified was a nation's own sense of destiny or a desire to occupy that space, the issue of will that you said. Do all four of them or any of them uh, have this desire to occupy that space. And here, in fact, I find a distinction between these four and the case of China. Because when Dr. Zakaria was writing his book, he had said that China is an emerging power, and he saw the economic and the military capability zoom up uh, of China. And besides that, he identified what he called the hunger for success. That hunger for success of China made it possible for it to rise and become from an emerging to an emerged power that we are seeing today. Uh, do we seem, see the same hunger for success in these four countries? And here I find the, the vision, uh, which is necessary for being able to occupy that space, uh, doesn't necessarily exist. I don't know enough about the other countries, but certainly in the case of India, I think uh, there is a reluctance to frame its growth and development in, along these uh, lines. Um, it's diffident to describe itself as a country which is on the, uh, you know, on the path to great power status, even regional power status. I find there's a hesitation to even frame it in that sense. And, and largely, I think I, I read this statement uh, uh, in Shamsaran's book, uh, which I quite agree with, where he, how India sees the world, in which he says that there is an inherent modesty in India's vision of itself. Uh, which is an ingrained, uh, I think, DNA of, of this country. So there's no burning, all-consuming desire for great power status. Uh, and there's a far greater understanding of how distant that goal is, uh, where you could be in that kind of a position. Uh, Foreign Minister Jay Shankar uh, describes India as being at an early stage of a major transition. I think we've all read the speech that he recently gave and which, you know, uh, uh, has become a policy statement on what India's vision of its foreign policy is going to be in the future. While he very much says that we have to shed our dogmas, but he still claims that we are at an early stage of that transition and that we have to do risk taking, but do it cautiously. The second thing, I think the second factor that determines whether a nation will emerge or not is the situation in the regional neighborhood of, of the country. Uh, and this may or may not let it rise to power. So while you emphasize the commonality between India, Turkey, Brazil, and Nigeria in terms of their asymmetrical advantage with respect to their neighborhood, compared to the other countries in the region, they are far ahead. But in the case of India, I find uh, China has the asymmetrical advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis India. Uh, so in fact, the commonality that I find in these four countries with their regions are that they're all in troublesome regions. Uh, and uh, none of the other countries in the region are going to give it a smooth ride uh, to see them rise even up to the level of a regional power. More particularly in, in the case of India, uh, since that matters the most for us, while there is a consciousness that as a subcontinent, you are one entity, uh, there's an interconnected geopolitical you know, issues there, uh, there is the ecological space that you're sharing, the shared you know, sense of uh, history, cultural bonds, all of that. Uh, but nevertheless, the geopolitical tensions in the region are also extremely palpable. Uh, so our neighborhood is dominated by China's shadow, uh, the new risen power, which has a rather assertive swag, as we've all seen in recent times, and which has territorial disputes with India. Uh, Pakistan, with, which has an entrenched animosity towards India, it likes to bleed the country and therefore is a strain on 
uh, your, your energies, which can be focused on the rise. And China's support to Pakistan only uh, leads to further strengthening of that brink brinkmanship behavior. India's relations with Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar are all riddled with their own sets of problems. And therefore, India's ability to rise, to occupy that space, is going to be constrained by the complex neighborhood. And I think the other countries will also face similar problems. Thirdly, the state of uh, domestic politics and the nature of the major actors involved, including issues of political legitimacy. Now, you did say that you know, nearly all the leaders in these four countries are similar to Trump. They're all strong men in their own way. Uh, and all four of them have a high political legitimacy too. Uh, they've all come up through democratic processes in some sense and have that base uh, from their democratic uh, uh, or their dem uh, democratic credentials. However, the nature of domestic politics, the ability to take everyone along, is critical if the political strength of the leader is not to be squandered away in fighting local domestic political battles. Uh, but we see that in the case of Turkey, uh, the issue of the Kurds, <laughs> Uh, in Brazil, the issue of uh, bribery, the, all the cases of graft, etc. Uh, and in the case of India, the current slew of domestic issues that we are seeing from Kashmir to CAA uh, will have a bearing on the country's ability to focus its energies on, on the rise. Fourthly, the state of the economy. And on this, I don't have to say much because it's a pretty obvious factor for any country to be able to rise. Money makes the mayor go. And unless the, the country exhibits the ability to reap the benefits of the economic potential. Uh, you know, India has been waiting for that potential to be, uh, to, to lead to some rich dividends for such a long time. So you, you could remain in the emerging realm forever uh, if you don't have the economic potential. And lastly, and here I come to the issue that you raised about China, uh, the ability of the emerging country to actually emerge is dependent not just on the presence of the space, or the presence of your own capabilities. It's also about the relative strength of the other claimants of that space. And in here, the relative you know, the strength of China, which is the claimant for that space, which is being emptied out by the US, um, is definitely much, much higher than any of us. And therefore, we see what I call the Python-like grip of China on many of these countries, uh, which becomes a constraining factor then for the rise, uh, uh, for their rise. So as India finds its space in this changing power equations, two things I think must be kept in mind, and I'll conclude with this. One is that though India has historically been wary of uh, claiming great powerdom, and I started by saying that India doesn't have that you know, burning vision for itself, it's never announced a grand strategy, even a national security strategy to that extent, uh, with a huge ambition. Um, but as Dr. Chaudhya says, the current geopolitical situation may force the country uh, to rise or to use the space in order to take that governance or stability issues into its own hand. Is India ready to do this? Uh, while it has traditionally functioned with greater subtlety of approach, uh, the current foreign minister in the speech that I just referred to uh, seems to weigh in, in favor of greater risk taking, uh, where he says that we have to shed our shibboleths of the past and that we have to, because it's a new world, we have to think about things differently and come up with a greater appetite uh, for risk taking. Uh, he reminds us that uh, ascending up the global ladder, and I'm quoting him, uh, did require taking big calls. And he's particularly referring to the cases of 1971, 1998, the nuclear test, 2005, the Indo-US nuclear deal, where you shed certain you know, old positions to be able to forge a new path. Uh, we also see that boldness on display with Pakistan, with China, at Doklam, uh, the Act East policy, uh, some of the initiatives that India has taken with HADR, uh, humanitarian and disaster relief initiatives. So therefore, he does see uh, he does seem more open to the idea of shedding uh, what he calls the dogmas of Delhi. Uh, but a complete leap of faith, I think, is yet to happen. Uh, he might have said that going, but I find the idea of the Indo-Pacific, for instance, one area where you've got a halfway house. So you've managed to create that idea of the Indo-Pacific, but India finds itself comfortable when the Indo-Pacific is perceived of or conceived as running from the shores of Africa to uh, the Pacific. Uh, so you basically, you want more stakeholders into the process. And you are one of the stakeholders amongst them, rather than being the stakeholder. In fact, I find India, you know, when the US 
uh, floated this idea of the Indo-Pacific, India almost became the bell of the ball without wanting to be uh, in that pivotal role. Uh, and the idea of quad still makes us very uncomfortable. We don't like the idea of military alliances of any kind. So therefore, we are conceiving of the Indo-Pacific as the free and open space which everybody can utilize for the benefit of everyone. So while you're following a hedging strategy against China, you still don't want to make it a, a policy where it could seem uh, threatening to China in any way. And therefore, this tightrope walking that India will have to do uh, in our region, given that China is at our doorstep and the US is you know, far away, that's where I find this risk taking will actually get tested. Secondly, the notion of strategic autonomy. I think that is and will remain uh, central to India's actions. In fact, protecting and promoting its national interests in a highly polarized world is not alien to India. We've done it in the past with the idea of non-alignment. I think what we are doing today is many alignments, lots of strategic partnerships with all the countries in order to find your way around uh, in this area. So finally, I just want to say that it would be in India's interest if the emerging powers, which have been identified by Dr. Cholia, did rise to create a multipolar world so that there is more room for maneuver against the old hegemon or the new hegemon. Uh, towards this end, India should uh, help to promote or participate in efforts, including being part of regional alternative groupings. Um, and we can think of some of them uh, with some uh, countries that you know, we want to engage in. Uh, what India's advantage lies in being perceived as a benign, non-threatening nation, unlike our neighborhood, our, our neighbor. Uh, it's an open and plural democracy, it's secular credentials, it's behavior of restraint and responsibility, which got President Bush to call us a responsible nuclear power. All of this fosters a perception that India is a non-threatening nation, and therefore others are willing to join up with you uh, for some of these efforts. Uh, it will require multiple engagements with all kinds of players uh, to take the risks. And as India's capabilities grow, India will rise to power automatically. But the focus has to be on the buildup of the comprehensive national power, or what we in India say comprehensive national development uh, for the well-being of your own populace. And I think this. Uh, growth of this kind internally will then allow you sufficient conditions to occupy the space. Uh, but just the presence of the space itself is not enough. So many more pieces have to fall in place. But my compliments uh, for a very well-written and a very thought-provoking book. I enjoyed reading it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sethi, for uh, making um, some very valuable points, and I think taking the discussion, bringing the discussion uh, to India and how India looks at uh, this uh, this notion of um, itself as a rising power, and you know, between China and, and and America, how India is positioned, and I think that that also speaks to some of the other uh, countries here as well. Uh, let me now invite um, Dr. Manoj Joshi for his comments, who is a distinguished fellow at ORF and a very seasoned commentator and and journalist. Uh, also writing very extensively on international affairs. Thank you, uh, Professor Pant. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not here to come up with any kind of a theory. I have some, I went through the book, which is fascinating, uh, the way it has dealt with the unfolding of the Trump disruption uh, of the international system. And uh, what's invaluable, because we often read about India, US, et cetera, were the portions I found with, related to Turkey and to Nigeria, uh, you know, the, the, and Brazil, uh, because that was a kind of an uh, addition of knowledge in that sense, because it go in depth into that, those particular areas. Now, Professor Cholia calls his uh, um, Trump's presidency the two-track presidency, where the president himself focuses on the narrow nationalist agenda, uh, while parts of the administration continue to function uh, in the kind of liberal international, uh, where they resist, you know, the, the, the adults in the room, as uh, sometimes been called. But as we know that initially, in, increasingly, the adults have been thinned out um, of the system. And now it's Trump. And um, there is every possibility that uh, Trump will win uh, the, the uh, re-election. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any real challenge to him. You know, Trump, uh, Henry Kissinger pointed out in a Financial Times article in 2018, Maybe one of those figures of history who appears from time to time to mark the end of an era and to force it to give up old pretenses. The Trump may not even self-consciously see himself uh, that way, but 
there he is, and this is what he is doing. I mean, he's forcing a change of an era. And the response of the, the domestic response you can make out when you look at the Republican Party, which used to be the party uh, of conservatism, of responsibility, of, of uh, liberal uh, free trade, etc., has completely lined up behind Trump, which indicates the strength uh, that Trump brings into, uh, into the, uh, the game. Now, the, um, the, the shift that we see has been manifested by a US military pullout from various crisis zones. Some of these, of course, crises were the creation of liberal internationals. See, I think uh, when we look at some of the, uh, the when my, my problem is that when you look at the world today and you say Trump has changed this world, I wonder whether Trump changed the world or those foolish people who took the United States into a number of wars of choice and wars of uh, you know, what do they call them? The war of choice and wars of something else. Compulsion. Yeah. Yeah. Compulsion. And spent $10 trillion. $10 trillion in this, uh, in the last two decades have been spent in these wars. Meaning no, every, any other country would have just gone uh, bust. But here we have the United States, uh, despite all that money, now of course pulling back, but still outspending everyone. I mean, the $711 billion is its uh, military budget you know, which is more than, I think, all the others combined virtually. So given this, um, uh, this was the money that could have gone into what Trump wants, meaning he wants better roads, better cities, um, how uh, the American healthcare system is a scandal, the American housing um, uh, for the poor, uh, the treatment of the poor is a scandal, and yet it goes on. It still remains the formidable um, uh, technological um, and financial power uh, of the world. But when it comes to Trump, of course, uh, the, the uh, Trump has uh, pulled out people. He has reduced the, the, the diplomatic interest of the United States in various issues, crises, et cetera, human rights, democracy. All this used to be a big thing with the United States, but Trump not interested. Uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, issue has compelled. Uh, now, Trump was the guy who trashed the TPP. Trans-Pacific Partnership, the one chance that the, the, the United States had of countering China in a sophisticated um, uh, fashion, uh, everything had been worked out, the TPP, this thing, and Trump walked out of that. And so now you are stuck, so now he has come up with what's called the BUILD Act, Better Utilization of Investment Leading to Development Act. Now, looking at the act itself, Basically, what it does is it's like it's dressed up the old OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, where um, the idea is that the private sector comes forward uh, for all these uh, projects in the uh, for for infrastructure and other projects in the in the uh, Indo-Pacific world. The problem is, you see, the private sector has always been notoriously averse to doing things on infrastructure. Private sector doesn't mind selling toothpaste and making profit and and this thing, but you know, expecting the private sector is going to build airports and roads and in, uh, to challenge the Belt and Road investment, I think is not uh, fair. Then, of course, re U.S. Another thing that the move away from internationalism has been the reduced role or the rejection of the U.S. in rulemaking international institutions, walking out of UNESCO, well known, walking out of the the the, the, the climate change um, uh, uh, COP mechanism, climate change convention mechanism. Then recent, most recently, the trashing of the WTO appellate court, which I think <coughs> is preliminary to uh, trashing WTO itself. You see? Uh, now, of course, the US global, uh, hitherto four, meaning from uh, 1945, US global policy was based on geopolitical agenda that we must prevent the rise of any hegemon on either ends of Eurasia. Either in the East or in the West, there must be no challenger to the U.S. hegemony. You see, so in uh, the West, the liberal capitalism gave rise to the NATO. So you had the strong NATO alliance, which eventually you can say was able to prevail over the challenger, which is the Soviet Union, uh, ex-Soviet Union. Russia is now not much of a challenge, no matter what Putin may do here and there. But the 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 Russians don't have that capacity. The problem is in the East, but in the East there was no comparable system. 
you had a hub and spoke system where the US had alliances with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia, et cetera. Uh, Ashton Carter tried to create this, uh, this concept of uh, principal security networks. But you don't really have something. But what Trump has done is to damage that. Even the hub and spoke system, I mean, see, we know that um, the, uh, what has happened between, uh, between uh, Japan and Korea, for example. The, 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 the Koreans walked out of the in, uh, in, uh, intelligence sharing uh, agreement. It's virtually the relationship uh, is absolutely uh, at the worst possible level. And this is the area where a hegemon like the United States could enforce order, but we completely ignored it. So, the, 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 uh, so if uh, you say you either you pay more to defend yourself, uh, or we, we won't defend you, or the other consequence is that both Japan and South Korea go nuclear. Meaning I'm talking of a logical uh, end out there. They both go nuclear. They both have, both have the capacity um, uh, to do that, which of course then majorly disrupts the, 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 the uh, world order uh, in East Asia. Now in such um, uh, circumstances, you could well ask why is the US taking uh, so much interest in the, uh, in the South China Sea issue or maintaining the kind of military establishment it has in the Indian Ocean region. I mean, after all, the US no longer dependent on oil of the uh, Middle East. So why it still has the, uh, the, the, the fifth fleet there, Diego it's uh, Diego Garcia. It has all the um, commitments are still going um, uh, strong. South China Sea, there have been more phone ops under um, uh, Trump than earlier. Here, the interesting thing is that Trump himself does not seem to be so invested in this. This is really the still where the internationalists are managing to, international liberal or otherwise, are managing to carry the day. If you actually hear Trump, he he's doesn't get worked up over um, the South China Sea or, or any of that. That's not his interest at all, that he keeps on you know, um, uh, this thing. The, uh, but what does you know, uh, one make of the abandonment of the concept of uh, the US abandonment? The US is actually, uh, beyond all this, has abandoned the idea of unipolarity. Basically, they themselves, now on, on one hand, they are, uh, Trump is doing and saying what he wants. On the other hand, they came up with a national security strategy and a national defense strategy, which said that Russia and China are the two principal uh, people who are disrupting, um, uh, who are revisionist uh, powers. They are strategic competitors. So at the other level, the, the United States is defining uh, um, uh, rivals. Chinese leaders and theoreticians, uh, you know, they, uh, if you read some of the Chinese writings, they see huge global opportunities. They see that if, uh, when Trump is done with the systems, a huge uh, advantage to them. And the Chinese have been seeing this consistently. They've seen this uh, since the US response to the 9-11 attack, the decision to invade uh, Iraq, the 2008 financial crisis, and now the US foreign policy under Trump. They say that it's a God-given opportunity for us. Meaning this is something which, um, the, uh, but the big question one must ask, and this is something, uh, and I think in the remarks that you made, uh, uh, looking at the world, world uh, responding to China, there seems to be an assumption that China wants to be a world power in the nature of the United States. You know, that's a global power. That is that you have bases all over the place, the only uh, power that is capable of operating uh, any and everywhere. But th I don't think that's really true. I, th I don't think that's really true. And I don't think that can also happen in the near term. Because if you look at, for example, the, the Western Pacific, yes, up to the first island chain, now the Chinese have a, a certain capacity that they can prevent the US uh, from operating uh, in the event of war also from operating that close to their mainland. But beyond that, I think there are, there are still questions. And beyond, uh, leave alone the island chain, leave alone the Western Pacific, Indian Ocean, meaning periodically we have noises saying that, oh my god, the Chinese are coming to the Indian Ocean. The Chinese are far, far away. They've just about launched their second uh, aircraft carrier, which is nowhere near capable. Uh, uh, you know, so we are talking of decades. We are talking of decades here. So, so the big question to ask is, do Chinese really want to uh, have the capacity to operate off, uh, let us say, Chile? I don't think so. I think the Chinese have a very clear idea of what they want. And that 
particular clear idea really relates, number one, to their immediate, um, uh, is their own security, the neighborhood, South China Sea. People talk about it a lot. Often they do, uh, do not mention that one of the crucial region, reasons why China is doing what it does in the South China Sea, um, uh, at least in the Spratly Islands, uh, et cetera, is, has to do with its uh, deterrent, second, uh, his sea-based deterrent in Hainan Island. The Hainan Island is the place where all the Chinese nuclear propelled submarines and uh, nuclear ballistic missiles are based. And given the nature of the seas, the, the Chinese concept is of a bastion defense in the sense that the submarines will not go out of that region. They will be deep in the ocean and from there they will uh, launch. So they want to sanitize the area around uh, the, the, uh, the, that, the uh, Hainan Island to make sure that they are able to uh, to secure their second strike capability. I'm not saying that's the only factor, but all I'm trying to say is that when we analyze um, uh, the Chinese behavior uh, in, the, in, in the South China Sea, we should not forget this uh, important, very important factor that their entire second strike capability is based on that island which is at the head of the uh, South China Sea. Now, of course, uh, liberal internationalists may see confrontation with China as a means of maintaining traditional US hegemonic liberalism uh, with the use of tariffs, meaning now the, what, what the, um, uh, as I said, uh, that the, uh, the, the United States, uh, Trump has a certain interest, meaning he has used tariffs, he has used technology, but as we are seeing, and, and this is just very recent, that the new uh, phase one agreement uh, on the technology thing, I was just looking at it and, and, and I was looking at the Reuters story which says US finalizing rules to limit sensitive technology exports to China and others. So uh, about November of 2017, the US started uh, saying that look now, uh, these Chinese have become very, this thing, uh, uh, dangerous and emerging technologies, we must do something. Now since then, since November 17, now they're still finalizing the rules. This really has to do with quantum computing, AI, some very, very cutting edge kind of stuff, 3D uh, printing. But what the story says is that far from coming up with very strict rules which will completely isolate China, the rules are actually fairly mild. So which means that does the Trump administration really want uh, the kind of scenario which has often been talked about, this decoupling that they want, they, they want the US and Chinese um, uh, economies to be decoupled completely? I don't think so. So when I say I don't think so, what I mean is that there may be people in the US, there are hawks. Bolton, for example, was a, there was a complete hawk in the, even in the uh, trade thing. Uh, you know, you, you, you have um, uh, hawks out there who want to say that, you know, we must some, simply not give China any leeway. On the other hand, there is huge in US corporate interests, meaning whether you supply um, uh, chips or whether you supply components, or assemblies, sub-assemblies, uh, to Chinese companies, that's their profit. Meaning the, the, the um, uh, I, I haven't made them, but I, have, I know in the case of Japan, for example, that some uh, 15 to 20% of <coughs> Japanese corporate profits depend on their China business. And so that uh, I suspect is probably true also um, of the American uh, companies. Now, just at the conclusion, I'd like to just look at the India thing. You know, in this, we referred to India, the, fine, uh, the foreign minister's calls, take a big calls, shed shibboleths. Shed shibboleths, incidentally, was the title of his father's uh, edit, book that his father edited, if I recollect. But, uh, but I think the FM is coming from, uh, EAM is coming from a different place. The EAM actually, uh, the way I see it, is pushing for a closer alignment with the United States. His shedding shibboleths means that abandon non-alignment and openly ally with, uh, with the uh, United States. That is my understanding. This leading power business, that's a bit, uh, because if we are talking of, see, the thing is that, um, and I don't blame, because why? Because of the dilemma. Because you have mentioned all these emerging, um, you have mentioned Turkey, et cetera, et cetera. Our problem is very peculiar, Indian problem. Indian problem is, that we need the US. We need the US because of our own failure. We have failed with our own uh, economy. We have failed to get into that high growth track 
which would have then enabled us to come up with a military capacity which could have given us a certain autonomous role, uh, autonomous and unique role in the Indian Ocean region. Now we are stuck with a situation where uh, the economy is not taking off, the armed forces, I mean, so you have to look at the budgets very closely, to, uh, meaning um, uh, what happens is in the newspaper every day you see government approves 40,000 crores for this, government approves missile systems, all those are only approvals. <laughs> There's no money. No money has been uh, put in there. The government has been very niggardly uh, with, uh, with the defense budget. And this is the time when they start hacking. What they gave last year uh, from uh, the MOD is told from October onward, don't, no more, uh, don't spend any more money. That's it. So it will go into the revised budget next year. So the fact of the matter is our own weakness, our own culpability has led to a situation where there is a serious imbalance of power in our uh, region and in relation to us, meaning we have China coming all over us in South Asia, whether it is in Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan was always uh, uh, there, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar. We have a, we, we, we uh, in, in the Indian Ocean region, as I said, it, it's still a distant thing. And uh, in the Indian Ocean region, the dominant power will be the United States for a long, long time to come because I don't see the Chinese um, you know, sort of having to go through the Straits of Malacca, I mean, so you're sitting ducks out there or any of the other uh, Straits. So I don't see, and I'm not sure that the Chinese are really interested. That's my other, uh, this thing, which is something which needs to be, whether they are interested in becoming kind of like the US, you cannot replicate, I don't think it is possible to replicate in the 21st century, the kind of power that the US uh, has become uh, and remains. I also don't see, and especially when you look at, um, I've already given you the example of the defense budgets, which are uh, the military budget, which is huge, uh, but also the, the, the uh, uh, technology. In the area of technology, where, where the US lead um, is, uh, uh, the US lead still remains formidable. And with the US now geared up, now the big question, of course, is how Trump plays out domestically in the United States. Because if U.S. has all these problems, it, it has serious political problems. The, the, there are serious uh, political problems in the United States. The, the division between the Republicans and Democrats seems to be more severe uh, than um, uh, between the, you know, the, the, the right and the left in many other places. And it's almost unbridgeable. I Meaning, you look at the votes in the, the impeachment uh, thing. So this is some, and, and the, the, the dysfunction of the US system goes down to the judicial system, it goes down to the states, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I think what the US really needs is domestic leadership. You need a, a, a president who can fix things, uh, an FDR-like uh, figure, uh, who can uh, take care of, uh, first take care of the domestic agenda. But the US is lucky, number one, because of its geography, number two, because of, of its size and its, um, uh, its, uh, uh, its uh, educational uh, capabilities, meaning the, uh, of its research and education uh, system. So it still has, and as I said, $10 trillion gone down the drain, they don't even think about it. And I suspect that even if another $10 trillion goes, they will still be able to uh, manage. But the fact of the matter is that they, the, 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 uh, their decline has been self-inflicted, just as ours has been. Ours has also been self-inflicted. So this, uh, when you measure this, you have to see, um, uh, uh, were we competing at our best and still bested, or were we not competing at all? And I suspect we were not competing at all. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. And I think because uh, we have to conclude at five sharp, so I'll open this up for, for your questions, comments, observations. Yes, yes. Yeah. But please introduce yourself and just. And my next question is, can a nationalistic and robust Brazil in the long term can it question U.S. Monroe Doctrine? Uh, very briefly, Shriram, I, we seem to really be uh, holding 
Trump responsible for all the disruptions which are caused in the world today and rather saying that if China is becoming an emerging power, it's basically because under Trump, the USA is vacating the space, the strategic space. Uh, I really wonder if it had been some other president, would things have been any different really? Uh, I have a sense that China's rise began much before Trump came, became the president. And China had begun to assert under Xi Jinping its place and its ambitions. Even during Obama's time, Quad became a reality during that time. Uh, there were many initiatives. I mean, I'm not going to, the time is very short. So uh, Trump, to my mind, is, is actually quite a helpless spectator to the demise of the US power rather than the cause of it. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Chaurya. Point about Trump being the great disruptor in US foreign policy is well taken. Uh, as far as shouldering responsibility and the threat to multilateralism is concerned. But uh, as Dr. Joshi touched on it, for countries like ours, which are at the receiving end of US foreign policy here, how much faith and attention can we entrust in, say, the traditional establishment, including the Pentagon and the State Department, um, as far as maintaining some level of predictability is concerned in US foreign policy and defense policy? I'm a visiting fellow here at ORA. Um, I guess one of these, thank you for your talk. I think one of the assumptions um, in, the, in the talk was that Trump is likely to win next year. And um, I would say, just from my own personal perspective, having worked on the last campaign, is that Trump had a perfect election night last time. And so, you know, it's going to be hard for him to repeat that going forward. So, point being that it's highly likely less than a year from now. We could have a Democratic president who believes very strongly in the post-World War II international order uh, that we've been talking about. So if that is the case, how do you see um, these countries that you've been talking about responding? Thanks. I just wanted to add to the last couple of questions because I had similar thoughts as I was you know, listening to the discussion. I'm Kalyani. I'm also with Jindal Global, colleague of Sriram's. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I also do not think it's a foregone conclusion that we are definitely looking at another uh, Trump presidency. Uh, but to go back to the issue of um, continuity, um, two factors come to mind. First, the extent of polarization which has been referred to. What stops, since there's like no middle anymore to fight for, what stops the Democrats to completely jettison everything that Trump has done and you revert to you know, conventional business as usual, one. And two, given that we have this revolving door in US, in the US between private interests and the executive branch and the think tank echo chambers, um, again, can we expect, you know, that to be a mitigating factor or something that will push back against a lasting legacy of what Trump's politics have been? Okay, I think uh, I'll, I'll give Sriram the floor Given now. The and, and five minutes, uh, I'm going to a lot of substantive questions, and thank you all. Um, I'll start with uh, Manpreetji's point about whether they have the hunger for success, to use um, um, Farid Zakaria's term. Uh, rising powers, inherently modest, do they have the manifest destiny and the desire to be great powers? Well. Uh, if you read the chapters, in each of these, I trace the um, origins of the thinking associated with this muscular foreign policy in each of these countries. Um, there is the concept of Pax Nigeriana and Pax Africana. There is the concept of Brazil providing uh, leadership for the entire hemisphere uh, and counterbalancing the US. There is the idea of um, Neo-Ottomanism, which has been uh, uh, overdone uh, and has actually come back to bite uh, Erdogan. But he wants to dominate. Um, and we have leading power. I mean, even though some of us uh, think that we are not doing enough to, uh, 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 you know, to exert our influence in the region, I think last five years, since 2014, we have done a lot more with a clear goal. You know, in the past, there was no goal to our ambition 
to be a major power and to be a driver of institutions and of processes. And we are doing it. So in all these countries, it's there, but it is contested. So um, in all these countries, there are um, uh, naysayers, uh, people who want to uh, obstruct the rise of their own countries. So, uh, and there are many who insist that first we must fix the domestic problems of these countries before they can go global. And uh, every time, for example, Nigeria does something for uh, ECOWAS members, there's a huge opposition within Nigeria and the opposition party say, oh, we have you know, hunger in our own country, we have Boko Haram, why are you giving aid to Gambia or Cameroon or to uh, Central African Republic? Let's first fix our own problems. You know? Don't be so, don't do grandstanding. We cannot afford it. So can we, can, so, so there are a lot of skeptical voices in all these countries trying to pull back the rise. And my, my position is very clear in this. You know, if we lose this opportunity, a window of opportunity that's come up with Trump, uh, it's never going to come back to us. Because if we wait for another 20 years and say, let all people in India have toilets, let everybody live well, let us raise the per capita income first, and then do charity abroad, and then think of uh, hegemony and spheres of influence, I think by the time the game would be already closed and over. It would be not just a bipolar, but I dare say a, a potentially a unipolar world you know, under, under Pax Sinica. Mm. So I don't think we should, we should um, you know, wait. It's not, never been an either or. I think Harsh and I have been arguing for a long time that we cannot um, wait for better times or to fix all our domestic problems. Economic slowdowns, yes, ma'am. I mean, most countries, most of the emerging powers have lost their sheen. BRICS countries are all struggling. Um, Brazil, in fact, has been in recession for a number of years. And so is South Africa. Um, China slowed down. India slowed down. But I think uh, you look at the demographic basis. I, I pick countries that are fairly large. Brazil, 200 million people. Nigeria, 200 million people. 1.2 here, billion here. Uh, Turkey is uh, not as big. But still, um, the point is, uh, you know, the fundamentals, as we say, are still on our side. I mean, that is the whole notion of emerging powers, right? That we've got something going, territory, size, population, fundamentals, and hopefully that vision. And, you know, that's why this book is normative. I mean, it's not simply representing the reality. I mean, if I look at the reality, I can say none of these countries really has a chance. You know, we are all going to depend on either China or the U.S. We, we will bandwagon. Right, we are, we'll be forced to bandwagon. But on the other hand, I, I'm also, you know, trying to uh, preach and proselytize to the elites in these countries and to the, you know, strategic communities like the people around this table that we should not let this opportunity go. You know, it's a historic window. Um, coming to the uh, Manoj's question about does China want to be a global power? That's a good point, sir. In fact, you know, the debate has been going on. Uh, there are many people who have a um, a defensive understanding of China's foreign policy, saying that it's fairly, largely conserving its own um, economic interests and doesn't want to repeat um, our, our Pax Sinica will never happen. You know, the Pax Americana on the lines of Pax Americana. Now, uh, in, definitely there's no military dimension to Chinese um, expansion. They have gone up to Djibouti, but uh, in Africa and Latin America, they don't have bases and they don't really have the kind of force presence that the U.S. historically used to have and is now abandoning. So to that extent, um, they, the Pax Sinica is going to be different. But I think in terms of, if you see the BRI and the sinews by which they have expanded, um, and the, just the political and economic influence they have in different regions of the world, it is phenomenal. I mean, uh, you go to any part of Africa, Latin America, or the developing world, or even Central and Eastern Europe, where they have that 16 plus 1 uh, program right now, China, 16 plus 1. I mean, wherever there are countries that are weak and needy, the Chinese are there, right? With bags of money and with influence. So, uh, so if you look at military capabilities, it looks like, yes, it's still a US, you know, it's still the top dog. But if you look at political influence, economic influence, and ability to shape outcomes in these countries, I think China is a rival or, or, or arguably superior to the US in many parts of the world today. And it will continue to be so as long as they have that 5 or 6%, you know, the growth. Um, India not spending enough of, on defense, I completely take your point, sir. It's been, you know, I'm a big fan of our prime minister, and so is Harsh. But we have been disappointed with the defense spending and with the, 
you know, the lack of uh, uh, budgetary outlays, um, you know, less than 2% of GDP, doesn't, the strategic gap is actually going to increase with China. That's a fact, and we have all been worried about it. Um, same with our diplomatic core. Day after, I'm going to the FSI to give a talk to the uh, probationers, and I'm happy to be able to build their capacity, but look at the numbers. Hardly 32 or 34 have been hired as for the Foreign Service this year. We need at least 120 or 150. Uh, but that's where the question go, goes back to the ambition. Do we want to be a driver of global processes and institutions and to have our diplomatic presence around the world to solve problems, to offer our good offices, to be proactive? And for that, we need a much bigger force, right, which we don't have. And so, well, the word I hear is, well, we didn't get the budgets to hire more people uh, and to expand the foreign service, you know. Um, so, you know, the demands of the welfare um, state are so massive, you know, and within the country and the electoral politics and all those things, that uh, it's, it's the same with all these countries, you know, and these can be a drag down. And I'm not denying those. If you see the book, I'm saying there are drag down factors. I'm showing what are the weaknesses of these four countries. But end of the day, if we don't, you know, um, treat this as a kind of a launching point, it will never come. Uh, briefly, audience questions. Uh, assuming that Trump will win, you see, I, I, I request you to please read the book. We have copies here, and I'm happy to sign them. Um, I'm not saying that Trump uh, is, is going to win. In fact, I don't speculate about it at all in the book. Um, but the populism he represents is now fairly widespread. And in fact, I cite surveys of uh, across American society, whether you are a supporter of Democrats or Republicans, most of them agree in this transactionalist and isolationist approach to foreign policy. The majority of American public is tired of wars and interventions and supporting allies and uh, you know partners around the world. So that liberal internationalism is an elite project. It does not have the popular legitimacy. And you see the introduction of the book, I'm talking about how it's a wider trend. If Elizabeth Warren becomes president, uh, even if Joe Biden wins the president, it's an outside uh, chance. But let's say even if he wins it, I, I, I'm pretty sure that they're not going to go back to heavy interventionism around the world. This thing, you know, is based on the threat perception. Please read the book. I talk about, you know, periods of threat and periods of normalcy. The American public believes we are now in a period of normalcy. We don't need to go out and be big around the world. We don't need to be the global cop anymore. So in a democratic society, leaders take the cues from, this, from the public. So whether Trump wins or not, whether it's eight years of Trump or four years of Trump, I believe I'm talking about the phenomenon, and you will see that in the book, and how it reflects the social forces within America and the churning within America. Um, can we rely on the deep state? That is a good question uh, for India. We've tried that. We continue to, you know, two plus two dialogue is happening today, is it, uh, in Washington? So we continue to work with the so-called deep state or the uh, permanent establishment. It has yielded some dividends. We have signed Comcast, for example, during Trump administration. Um, and uh, so things do happen. But, you know, on the other hand, the trade uh, dispute goes on, and we have not been able to find a bilateral settlement yet uh, because Trump imposes more and more conditions. So um, I think the deep state can only take us uh, somewhat, uh, some far. In fact, that's the case with all the four countries. I show all the four countries have figured out a way of finding allies within the US system in spite of Trump and working around Trump. But that doesn't always work. As Manoji was saying, Trump is weeding out one after the other. Um, um, in fact, Bolton was probably the last big liberal internationalist or globalist in that camp. And now he's, the, he's not there. He's got his as yes man now. And if he wins November 6, 2020, believe me, it's going to be a rout of the liberal internationalists. It's, it takes time, right? Power consolidates over time. First term, he was conflicted. There were factions. But if he wins a second time, I think he's going to replace everybody who believes in globalism. Um, other dimensions, uh, other presidents were the same. There was a question about whether, yes, in fact, I show in the book that Obama started the trend of uh, stepping back from global interventionism. And in fact, I argue that what Obama started, but Obama still was invested heavily in non-military forms of US uh, involvement and global leadership. For example, shepherding the climate change, um, you know, human rights, or multilateral trading system. Uh, they were, you know, involved in different regions of the world, you know, uh, human, the whole thing. And they still at least had a notional thing called a pivot to Asia or a rebalance strategy to Asia. Now, none of those exist, right? So um, in that sense, uh, uh, Obama also understood the public's tiredness and the wish to withdraw 
from many parts of the world. But he still tried to maintain that overall liberal internationalist uh, rhetoric, if not the reality. Uh, now, you, you know, you can, you can hear it in 140 characters of the president that if you saw the tweet the, three days ago, um, all the presidents before me have been spending time and money to build other nations and other parts of the world. I'm so glad that in these three years we have been building America, right? So um, it's clear cut um, that this is a different priority. So in that sense, there is some continuity. Uh, obviously, a large bureaucracy like the US is not going to overnight be converted into a, a, you know, in another mold, it cannot be remade in another mold. That is Trump's struggle. And I show that on tariffs, for example, he's, there are uh, records showing he's complaining to his aide saying, I want tariffs. I want more tariffs. And these smart alecs around me, my advisors and the bureaucrats and the so-called experts are telling me, Mr. President, you can't do it. You know, with China, I say, why don't we have forced them to have buy 60 billion of American agriculture products as part of the deal? And then the advisors are saying, well, uh, Mr. President, we don't have enough agriculture produce to sell of that amount to, to China. And says, so it's very simple. Let them buy our agriculture products and also our tractors and make it 60 billion and force them to buy 60 billion, right? So, so Trump is fighting the system. And I'm showing that this true track presidency Manoji mentioned throughout the book. And that is the dynamic which is most interesting, you know? So it's not like America has completely changed. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a tussle going on for the national interest, for defining the national interest. And each country is adjusting. But more than adjusting, we need strategy and much bigger uh, vision for the future. Um, infrastructure alliance, why are we not joining the US? The US has no money to give out for any infrastructure. I mean, most of these build or the, in Africa, they have this uh, infrastructure finance development corporation, IFDC. It's, it's peanuts, you know. Um, they don't have the resources to match BRI. Uh, and uh, so um, I don't think, in fact, we are allying with Japan on this. There's a partnership for qua quality infrastructure and CDRI, Prime Minister's co Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. These are areas where we may not have the resources, but we have the human resources and cap capabilities. And with the Japanese financing, the, the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor is supposed to be that, right? And that brings me to the larger point, uh, and I'll conclude there, is I'm not saying each of these countries can alone you know, lead their regions or fix their problems. I'm saying it has to be in combination with several other interested players uh, in the region. Like, for example, why are we doing so much with France now? Why are we trying to bring Russia back into the, um, the Indo-Pacific now? Jayashankar went to Vladivostok and specifically said, I, I invite Russia to come back to the Pacific. Why? Why, do, why are we trying to use Mayotte and uh, reunion with France? Uh, what is this thing going on with Japan? Just to give you a few examples. Likewise, each country has options, right? We need to think uh, more creatively and more proactively. We can't just sit back and say, I can never replace the US. I'm not saying you replace the US. In fact, I'm arguing that none of these countries can substitute the US. Uh, if they are gone, we need to find combinations. So that plurilateral thing has to happen, you know? On a, uh, and, and each of these countries must ultimately realize. Now, uh, last question, um, there was one on, can Brazil um, do a Monroe Doctrine of its own? Well, no, you see, they don't face major security threats in the region. You know, there's no jihadist challenge or any such thing. They don't have interstate wars much. You know, most of the borders are settled. The issue is with regime legitimacy. You saw all these protests happening, not just Venezuela, across the region. You know, Bolivia, there's been a very controversial ouster of uh, Morales. In all these cases, regime legitimacy linked to the militaries and the role in politics, that's a big question in Latin America. And there, Brazil can play a role. Brazil, even if it is under a far right, under Bolsonaro, it has the, uh, you know, uh, it's a democratic country and it is the largest power. And, but unfortunately, as I said, he is misguided. But uh, the system there is also fighting him, just like the system in the US is fighting Trump. So who will prevail, we'll see. Um, so to, to just sum up, you know, my own, my whole interest in this was a global south perspective mm -hmm. on the world order. You know, usually you hear these things, uh, not many Indian scholars write about, you know, these different regions of the world or about the U.S. and its role in the world. We, t we just tend to assume that it is dominant, it has got military power, it's the number one. I'm saying, let's look at influence, let's look at the shift, and let us plan for it, let's strategize for it. 
I don't mind a post-American world. In fact, you see throughout this book, I'm challenging the liberal assumption that America is a force for good. I'm saying that uh, you know there are pluses and minuses. They will remain a, a player, you know, in a seven or eight uh, power, uh, uh, eight uh, centered uh, multipolar world. America will always be a power, right? But the, we need to come out of the time warp that somehow it is the sole superpower. That some that thing is, you know, it's been repeated so often, it's become like a maxim. And people are not realizing that we are long past that stage, you know? So one of the things I want to do is to wake up elites in our respective regions and also to reach out to the general public, to young people, to start thinking about the world, how we can remake the world, especially our respective regions, you know? It's gonna be a more stable and better world if we have seven or eight powers than one or two. And I don't think we need two. Uh, the G2 is much reviled in India, you know? And if you go by Hugh White and some of these Australian scholars, they've been saying for a long time that America should just share power with the Chinese and you know let the decoupling happen. And eventually, we'll concede this space anyway. The West will concede Asia and, and Europe and Africa, uh, sorry, Africa and Latin America anyway. Let the Chinese take. I think we are in a different era, you know, that multipolarity is all around us. We need to realize, we need to grasp it, and we need to fight for it. So that's the message of this book. So please read it, and I'm happy to sign copies. Thank you. Thank you, Sriram. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, addressing. And thank you for uh, thank you to the two discussants. And thank you all for being here uh, this late uh, on a wintry, um, wintry afternoon in, in Delhi. Uh, but uh, I'm glad this conversation happened. And uh, more power to your pen. And uh, I, I guess we'll have this conversation about Mr. Trump and the implications on global order for a very long time to come. So I look forward to seeing you once again.